Welcome to the 10th and final lecture of Physical Chemistry 2 Thermodynamics. Uh, this time around we'll be looking at the process of osmosis, yeah? so the process of mass transfer through a, a semi-permeable membrane yeah? along a chemical gradient from one part of a vessel to another yeah? and the resulting pressure, the so-called osmotic pressure from this process. So in the previous lecture, we have looked at equilibria um, between a solution and the pure solvent, yeah, where the pure solvent is in a different state. Yeah? So for example, as a vapor or as a solid. Yeah? And the solution in a different state, yeah? for example, as a liquid. Now we want to consider the case where the pure solvent is also in the liquid phase. Yeah? So uh, the figure here schematically shows us um, a so-called pfeffer cell. Yeah, the cell is close on all sides uh, and has two riser tubes here. Yeah, and it is separated down the middle by a semi-permeable wall. Yeah, this wall is permeable yeah, to the solvent but not to the solute. Yeah, historically people have uh, used either a pig bladder or a layer of copper to hexacyanoferrate to apply, applied on top of a porous plate. Yeah? Um, so now uh, in our experiment we will fill a pure solvent into the left half yeah, and a solution, yeah, for example, let's say sugar, a non-dissociative uh, solution of sugar um, into the right half. Yeah? Now initially uh, the meniscus has the same height in both riser tubes. Yeah? We then find uh, that the meniscus gradually sinks in the left tube yeah? and rises in the right yeah? until a certain level difference is reached. And this difference depends of course on the concentration of our solution. Yeah? At equilibrium yeah, the solution is under a pressure yeah, that is higher by the amount of hydrostatic pressure. Yeah, here visualized with this uh, difference. Yeah? And we call this pressure difference the osmotic pressure uh, large pi. Yeah? So first let's look uh, for a qualitative explanation for this phenomenon. Yeah? Remember, so now essentially all, everything which we discussed so far comes sort of together. Yeah? Remember from lecture five, our, our um, equilibrium condition uh, in the closed system. Yeah? So this is essentially here ds equals zero yeah? because entropy in a closed system depends on temperature and pressure. We concluded back then that at equilibrium there must be no temperature or pressure differences. Yeah? So this is essentially here in our equation uh, uh, 3.2, 3.3 and 3.4. Yeah? Otherwise, any differences would lead to irreversible balancing, yeah? which would then in, uh, increase entropy. And that would essentially mean we, are no, we have not been at, at equilibrium. Yeah? So the first uh, of these two requirements um, uh, must also be satisfied here in our um, experiment. Yeah? But the last yeah, in equation 3.4 is not. Yeah, so the pressure is not the same in all parts of the system. Yeah? Uh, and this is because the rigid semi-permeable semi wall here prevents uh, um, spontaneous pressure equilibration. Yeah? So at the beginning of the experiment, uh, equilibrium cannot exist yeah, because the, the chemical potential of a solvent um, is greater in the pure phase than in the solution. Yeah, therefore, the solvent will diffuse through the semi-permeable wall into the solution yeah, along our uh, uh, gradient of, uh, uh, of chemical potential. Yeah? Now, because of this ongoing dilution, yeah, the chemical potential of a solvent in the solution increases, but it will always remain smaller than in the pure solvent. Yeah? So, in principle, this diffusion process would never stop yeah, if the pressure and the solution did not increase at the same time. And this increase of pressure is, as we said previously, 
due to the build-up of the osmotic pressure, yeah, large pi. Now remember uh, lecture 8, yeah, so according to our equation 420, equilibrium will be reached when the chemical potential of a pure solvent, yeah, under pressure P, equals the chemical potential of a solvent in the solution, yeah, with activity um, uh, alpha 1, yeah, under the pressure P, yeah, plus large pi, yeah. So I, I wrote my previous statement down, yeah, equilibrium is reached when the chemical potential of a pure solvent under pressure P equals, uh, equals to the chemical potential of a solvent in solution, yeah, with activity uh, um, A1 under pressure P plus large pi. I think I said alpha 1 before and it says alpha 1, yeah, but we're going to use the activity A1 here, so my apologies for that. Um, anyway, so we take this, uh, this statement yeah, as a starting point for a quantitative analysis. Yeah? So we denote our solution phase uh, as alpha yeah? and the pure phase by beta. Yeah? And then we get uh, in equation 536 um, here our equilibrium condition. Yeah? So mu1 beta um, at P and A1 equals 1 uh, must be at equilibrium equal to mu1 alpha yeah, uh, with pressure P plus uh, large pi, the osmotic pressure, and yeah, A1. Okay, um, so uh, for this we can also write, yeah, mu1 star beta at, the, at a given pressure equals mu1 star alpha at uh, p plus large pi plus rt ln a1 p plus pi yeah now we have to remember yeah that the activity is pressure dependent yeah just like the chemical potential so if we want to relate these quantities to pressure in the solution phase yeah, we have to essentially restate this equation 537 here as 538. Yeah, so mu1 star beta uh, um, at pressure P equals mu1 star alpha at pressure P plus yeah, the integrals of our um, pressure dependent chemical potential yeah, between the limits P and P plus large pi. Yeah. Uh, this is delta mu1 star alpha over delta p at constant temperature by dp plus rt ln a1 yeah, uh, as a function of pressure plus rt integral between p and p plus pi of delta ln a1 over delta p at constant t dp. Yeah? So we, uh, we also know that uh, mu1 star beta yeah, uh, must be equal to mu1 star alpha yeah, since in our model system essentially both these quantities stand for the chemical potential of pure liquid solvent at the pressure P. Yeah? We plug that into our equation, yeah, eliminate uh, our mu's yeah, and we essentially get now equation 539 yeah, as rt ln a1 uh, at the pressure P equals minus the integral between P and P plus pi of delta mu1 star alpha over delta P at constant T uh, dP minus RT, yeah, again the same integral of delta ln A1 over delta P at constant T dP. And now remember um, the equations we derived for, for the chemical potential from the characteristic functions yeah, and the relationships for the first differentials, yeah, and that's stated here in equation 540 and 541. Yeah, so refer back to your notes if you if you don't quite remember those. Yeah, and we can uh, substitute this into 539, and we'll do this on the next slide because we're running out of space here. Okay, so we plug that in, and we're almost there. Yeah. Uh, we've got here our expression 542. Yeah, so now let's remember equation 417. Yeah, that we derived in lecture. I think it was lecture eight, 
for the pressure dependence of a chemical potential. Yeah, we've, I think we did this for the pressure and temperature dependence back then. So this is an excerpt. Yeah, so let's plug uh, this in uh, to our equation 542. Yeah, so we get then RT ln A1 at the pressure P equals minus the integral between P and P plus pi of uh, delta mu1 alpha over delta P at constant temperature dP equals minus the integral between P and P plus large pi of V1 alpha dP. Yeah. So here in equation 543, let's look at this integral here. Yeah, V1 alpha um, means pretty much a partial molar volume of a solvent in the solution. Yeah, and now we know liquids and solids uh, have a very small compressibility coefficient. Yeah, you can't compress them uh, even too much, let's say, uh, um, even if you exert pressure. Yeah, so we can consider v1 alpha here as independent of pressure yeah so in this integral v1 alpha uh, simply becomes a constant we can pull it out of the integral yeah so we can uh, uh, simplify this and write our equation 544 here uh, rt ln a1 at the pressure p is simply equal to minus v1 alpha yeah which is a partial molar volume of a solvent in the solution, yeah, times the osmotic pressure large pi, yeah. So now again we consider ideally diluted solutions, yeah. So F1 goes against one, yeah? and we can replace the activity A1 simply by our mole fraction X1, yeah. And X1 we know this is 1 minus x2 yeah? and we can again develop uh, um, ln1 minus x2 as a series yeah remember uh, uh, what we did in lecture 9 there yeah and we only take the first element x2 yeah and we get our equation 545 here yeah is minus R uh, rt times x2 equals minus v1 alpha times the osmotic pressure yeah uh, so id here means essentially ideally dilute solution yeah and we can simply uh, yeah so uh, since we're dealing with an ideally dilute solution yeah this partial uh, this partial molar volume yeah v1 alpha of a solvent is equal to the molar volume v1 yeah, of a pure solvent yeah so we can essentially restate equation 545 as our equation 546 yeah so this means uh, osmotic pressure yeah in an ideally dilute solution is equal to rt over v1 yeah which is a molar volume of a pure solvent times x2 yeah, we see now here from this equation that the osmotic pressure, yeah, large pi id of this ideally dilute solution is again proportional to the mole fraction of a solute x2. And it's again independent of its chemical nature. So just like uh, the depression of a vapor pressure, yeah, the elevation of a boiling point and the depression of a melting point uh, we know that the osmotic pressure belongs to the colligative properties. So we can still rewrite equation 546 as um, osmotic pressure of the ideally diluted solution times V1 equals N2 over N1 plus N2 times RT. Yeah, and now we realize the amount of solute N2 is small compared to, the, uh, to N1. Yeah, remember that we are at high dilution. Yeah, so we can essentially uh, neglect this term and we get N2 over N1 times RT. And now we consider that the total volume V yeah, of the ideally diluted solution is equal to N1 times V1 yeah, of the solvent here. So we essentially get here our relationship 548 as the osmotic pressure of the ideally diluted solution 
pi id times v equals n2 times rt. Yeah, and uh, this relationship yeah, between the osmotic pressure and the amount of solute was found by Jacobus Henricus van Hoff. Yeah, he got his not first he got the first Nobel Prize in chemistry. Yeah, but he didn't get it for this relationship. He got this for his research on the chirality of carbon compounds. Okay, now back to van Hoff's. Um, Apologies for the, for the ring. Uh, um, back to Van Hoff's uh, equation here. Yeah, we can bring 548 into a slightly different form. Yeah, by replacing the molarity of the solute C2. Yeah, with the molality of the solute M2 times the density uh, of the solvent rho1. Yeah, so this is essentially large pi id equals c2 times rt is approximately equal to rho1 times m2 times rt yeah where c2 is the molarity yeah uh, m2 is the molality of a solute and rho1 is the density of a solvent okay now the figure here on the right uh, shows how well this expression 549 actually works yeah and here in this example we're using a uh, sugar solution yeah so from the equation uh, we see that the osmotic pressure yeah for one for a one molar solution is equal to rt yeah mole per decimeters cubed yeah so at uh, 273 K, yeah, this is roughly equal to 25 bar. Yeah, that's an, that's an amazing amount of pressure. So how, uh, how is this useful? Well, we can pretty much now use uh, uh, measurements of the osmotic pressure. Yeah, like for example, in this pfeffer cell yeah, to measure concentrations yeah, and molecular mass. And we can do this fairly accurate, uh, accurately. Yeah? So you see here good correspondence between um, the measured example and uh, the equation. Now, the difficulty really here in these experiments using a, a pfeffer cell um, lies in creating the semi permeable membrane. Yeah? So getting an imper impermeable wall is easy for large molecules, yeah? but it's very difficult for small ions. Yeah, so historically, uh, the major application of osmotic pressure uh, was really in the determination of the molecular mass of macromolecules, yeah, like sugars and so on, and larger. So for low molecular weight substances, yeah, one can use, uh, as we saw on the previous slides, um, this uh, uh, copper 2 hexacyanoferrate 2 membrane. Yeah? And for high molecular weight substances, you, you can even get away with cellulose based membranes okay so now let's look back again at uh, 548 yeah so the volume v in this equation is uh, the volume available to n2 mole of the solute yeah so this equation as in the form it has here um, it formally agrees with the ideal gas equation yeah pv equals nrt yeah and we've observed such formal equivalencies yeah, between the behavior of ideal gases and that of ideal dilute solutions before. Yeah? And you will see uh, uh, many similarities like these throughout physical chemistry. Okay, so this brings us to the end of uh, physical chemistry 2, uh, kinetics and thermodynamics. Uh, next up is revisions and um, also, of course, physical chemistry free in the following year.